the slide here in a sec. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our second Google Hangout uh, for Space Resources uh, uh, Technical Committee of AIW. Um, we are very pleased that you can join us uh, this evening for the uh, US host. In most of the US, uh, very much familiar with the day uh, in uh, our friends. And we, uh, we are starting today uh, with a presentation uh, by Professor Koki Ho uh, at the University of uh, Illinois Urbana Champaign uh, on a topic very interested and very timely, uh, uh, looking at the, the logistics train and logistics planning for the use of uh, space resources. Uh, in in a uh, traffic model that includes the moon and and, and Mars, um, and the 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 purpose of our hangouts are really to expand our outreach uh, to a broad community and also to serve the the community of researchers and engineers who are working on uh, utilization of space resources around the world. And so uh, this is why, as, uh, as chair of the technical committee at AIAA, um, I wanted to really uh, uh, develop this, this tool uh, for, for the community to get to know each other, to get to know each other's research and, and ideas, and uh, expand our ways to communicate between conferences where uh, we have the opportunity to see each other face to face. So with, uh, without delay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor Koki Ho, who will uh, introduce uh, his work and start his presentation. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Koki Ho. I am uh, currently assistant professor at the University of Illinois. And uh, I'll, I'll join uh, Georgia Institute of uh, Technology, Georgia Tech, from this uh, August. And uh, so, uh, as uh, Lorraine introduced, I am um, uh, going to talk about some of the research about space logistics uh, with ISRU in consideration for human space exploration for uh, Moon and, and also Mars. So, let me share the screen so that I can start my presentation. So, uh, as I said, I. Uh, I am uh, currently at Un U University of Illinois, but I will join Georgia Tech from this August. So I included both email addresses, uh, email addresses here. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me. And the title um, is uh, for this research is a Space Logistics Planning with ISRU. And uh, I'll be talking about some of the uh, general research direction in uh, uh, space logistics. And then I'll talk about the one specific research that we have done recently to uh, uh, about how we uh, leverage ISRU for human space exploration. So uh, this slide is just an uh, introduction. So we already started uh, 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 with my introduction. But I'm, as I said, I'm currently uh, at U of I and I'm joining Georgia Tech. But I'm also director of uh, uh, the Space Systems Optimization Lab, where we focus on research of uh, uh, applying mathematical optimization and uh, uh, probabilistic modeling for space mission design. So we're trying to introduce a rigorous method to design space mission, including how we uh, use ISRU and how we develop, uh, uh, how we design missions that uh, take advantage of ISRU for, for human space exploration. I'm also the chair of uh, AWS Space Logistics TC. Um, so this is a TC that focus on uh, uh, space logistics, not necessarily uh, ISRU itself, but also uh, on-orbit servicing and uh, um, or micro logistics within space station and so on. We'll, I will talk about this a little bit uh, later on. I got my PhD at MIT and I did the uh, undergrad and master in Japan, University of Tokyo. I also spent some time at JPL and Airbus uh, uh, before I joined here. So uh, the, this slide um, is uh, uh, it's basically a brief introduction of what we do at the uh, Space Systems Optimization Laboratory. As I said, we our goal is our mission is to develop optimization methods to tackle complex space mission design and uh, systems engineering challenges. 
Uh, we do human space exploration, autonomous servicing, small sat constellation, and many other space-related uh, projects. And uh, uh, in today's talk, uh, I'll be mainly focusing on this human space exploration campaign and its logistics. So this is a background slide uh, that have been used uh, um, for a very long time by, by uh, different people in this community, in space logistics community. Um, it basically introduced what is the motivation uh, behind uh, the space logistics. Why do we need uh, research for space logistics? When we think about the past or current space exploration uh, campaign, like Apollo, ISS, uh, those are um, those are very complex missions, but from logistics point of view, they use a relatively simple paradigm. For Apollo, you use uh, something called the carry along. So basically, you carry everything you need to the destination and come back. And for the next mission, you you carry everything again. ISS is kind of the opposite. You use a resupply um, uh, paradigm. So basically, it uh, resupplies the consumables and uh, uh, even replace the crew. And when we think about the future space exploration, which involves multiple destinations, including the uh, uh, asteroid, the Cicerone space, the moon, and Mars, and also it involves multiple parties on the ground, different countries, commercial companies, and, and so on. So the, the space mission uh, will become much more complex than uh, what uh, compared with Apollo or ISS. So a pure carry along or resupply strategy may not be the best strategy. We need a new way to think about uh, how do we how we design the logistics it can be a combination of preposition prepositioning carry along resupply and uh, it can also take advantage of some of the in space logistics infrastructure which include isru and also propellant depot so nasa has been uh, focusing on this uh, space infrastructure recently uh, especially the isru and we have a uh, uh, NASA BAA um, that uh, 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 that is under the program called Next Step, uh, particularly focusing on ISRU trace study and ISRU mission, uh, uh, ISRU system design. And I am the PI of one of the project and uh, uh, to to focus on the ISRU trace study using the methodology that I will introduce later uh, in this slide deck. So I don't think I need to introduce what is ISRU to this community, but just a, uh, just a brief overview. So ISRU is basically an oil field in space. So it's, uh, it can generate resource from an in-situ environment. Uh, the resource it can generate include uh, uh, propellant, water, life support, gas, and so on. And it can be on the moon or Mars and uh, uh, potentially also on an asteroid. However, this ISRU design always comes with uh, um, limitation, which basically is it's a high cost uh, of pre-deployment. So you need a, a lot of prior investment to, to deploy those ISRU plant before it's actually become actually becomes useful. And also it, uh, it includes a very large plant mass sometimes. So this launch mass, of course, and also the cost uh, uh, is not negligible. So whenever we consider whether ISRU actually is effective or not, we need to consider the, the cost associated with that. Uh, including the pre-deployment and, and uh, um, all this plant mass and time associated with that. Problem Depot is uh, often discussed in combination with ISRU. It is basically a gas station in orbit. It stores propellant and sometimes also reusable structure. It can be at Lagrangian point, Earth orbit, it can be at DRO and, uh, and uh, many other orbits uh, in Cicerone space or even in Martian space. And uh, it can be very useful as a logistics infrastructure because, again, it can serve as a gas station in orbit. However, when we discuss ISO, uh, uh, Propan Depot, uh, like ISRU, we also have a limitation that we need to consider, which includes a refuel mission uh, uh, by tankers from the Earth or ISRU on the moon. Or, uh, uh, and also, it has a boil off effect where uh, the, the propellant can, can get boiled off because of the uh, uh, thermal control, uh, the limitation of thermal control. So uh, if we poorly design the program depot uh, mission, then it can diminish the, the, the effectiveness of, uh, of, uh, of the program depot technology. So uh, the key question here for both infrastructure, uh, that example that's shown here, uh, is that are, are they effective and efficient at campaign level? Considering both the deployment and uh, um, and the utilization over uh, uh, over a mission time horizon, 
And if they are effective or efficient, then how do we deploy them and how do we utilize them? So this includes both the assessment of the uh, effectiveness of ISRU and propaganda people, and also the mission design that will take advantage of this technology to the maximum extent. So this slide seven uh, is a brief introduction of space logistics. Space logistics, given this background, uh, um, space logistics research focus on the theory and practice of uh, uh, driving space system design for operability of managing the flow of material services information needed throughout the uh, space system life cycle. So this is a definition we give to space logistics uh, from our space logistics DC. And um, um, uh, there are some keywords here. One is uh, we're, we're dealing with a uh, flow of material. So um, we're also considering service information. Most of the presentation today is about the flow of material. So we are focusing on how to manage the transportation of materials in, in, in space. And also the second keyword I want to highlight is uh, uh, system life cycle. So we're not only considering one mission, or snapshot of mission, we're considering the entire uh, campaign, including the deployment of ISRU and, and utilization of it. So this slide eight is uh, some of the example research about uh, uh, on space logistics topic that I have performed in the past. We have done some research about uh, effectiveness, uh, the evaluation of effectiveness of a program depot for lunar exploration. We have done some research to consider what is a, uh, how do we coordinate the space station, space station operation and its logistics system. The third one is actually interesting. We have done some uh, uh, analysis about uh, uh, um, Mars One logistics. So Mars One is a, a project um, proposed by a Dutch organization to send human to Mars one way. And uh, um, so it's a very interesting case study for space logistics. So we did the independent uh, technical assessment of uh, Mars One and it uh, uh, attracted a lot of attention from the media. So I think there are some, uh, this is one way to show the, um, the power of this space logistics research. So all this research that I show in this slide are basically follow this procedure, the following procedure where we think of some new uh, mission design and uh, we analyze, analyze that design and we compare with traditional design and say how good it is or how bad it is. So it's mainly about assessment of, uh, uh, of uh, proposed design. But uh, I think a grand challenge in space logistics is uh, it's really how do you come up with a space mission design by itself, how, how can we automate this whole process of a space mission design? So uh, this is a grand challenge that uh, uh, I've been tackling, uh, my group has been tackling. How do we generate, how do we automatically generate the optimal architecture and design of multi-mission space campaign, including deployment and utilization of infrastructure elements? So instead of we, human, give a, um, give a, a good architecture, and then analyze, let the computer analyze it. Can we use a computer to generate the optimal architecture and design of a, a space campaign for human and uh, uh, so that we can explore the trace space systematically without human bias uh, in an objective way? So that is basically the, the uh, goal of uh, uh, the research that I have been working on. And now we introduce one uh, recent uh, development we have made uh, in, in this context. So uh, just to elaborate what I said, we want to uh, we want to automate this campaign level space mission. What we give the computer, what we give the uh, optimization is uh, uh, demand at the destination. For example, we say we want to send uh, six uh, crew members to the moon by say 2024 or 2028. Then uh, what the what this optimization methodology that we develop will tell you this entire that chart, this entire mission sequence. And uh, uh, so it, this entire mission sequence include the uh, trajectory, what kind of propulsion system you want to use, whether you need a staging or refueling or not, if so, when and where, and the consumable resupply logistics, and how many launches, when or where, from, from where to where, and the size, uh, sizing, design of spacecraft, or if you have a discrete number of uh, choice, then the choice of spacecraft. Whether you need depot or not, if you need it, uh, what size, where, 
whether you need ISRU or not, if needed, what size, where, and how do we deploy this? So all these questions are part of this mission design practice. And we want uh, uh, some optimization or some computer uh, program that will do all this, automate all this process for you. I'm not saying we will replace you know, every human designer's effort by a computer. That's probably not possible. But at least it can be used as a decision support tool to, to explore some of the uh, uh, trade space that human may miss and provide some uh, recommendation of uh, uh, mission design to facilitate uh, uh, the uh, space campaign design practice. So in this optimization that I will talk about later on today uh, in this uh, presentation, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll analyze and we'll optimize and we'll tell you what is the mission timeline, what is the sequence of the entire campaign. It will tell you the commodity transportation flow or payload, propane, consumables, and so on. And it will uh, size or, uh, or choose uh, optimal spacecraft and infrastructure for each leg of the uh, mission. So that's really what uh, the, the grand challenge we, we're tackling uh, in the space logistics research. So over the next uh, uh, um, uh, 20 minutes or so, I will introduce uh, one methodology we have developed recently. We also have some other methodology. I'm happy to share any of these uh, uh, research papers with you if you're interested in. But uh, um, from the time, uh, given the time limit, I will just introduce one research. So um, a lot of the uh, space logistics research start from uh, uh, what we call network modeling of space logistics. So we, we uh, introduce a new way of thinking for space mission. Instead of considering space mission design as a, a sequence of a trajectory design mission, we consider the space mission design as a network optimization problem, where the network optimization, uh, uh, network considers uh, arcs and nodes, and arcs uh, corresponding to each leg, each trajectory, and uh, nodes correspond to each orbit where we can, uh, for example, put a propellant depot or store some propellant or do a docking or staging maneuver, uh, uh, docking maneuver or staging. So these, uh, the nodes include, uh, uh, for example, like LEO or GEO or Lagrangian points, uh, and uh, also surface nodes like Lunar South Pole or uh, uh, Gale Crater on Mars and, and so on. So those are considered as nodes and the arcs connecting them. So, um, so this will convert this uh, space mission design problem into a network optimization problem uh, so that we can solve it in a similar way as what uh, Google Map does when it optimizes a route for you. For example, I'm at uh, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois now. If I want to go to, say, Washington, DC, I will first drive to the airport, and then I will take a, a plane. And once I land in DCA, I'll probably take some uh, uh, public transportation and and maybe take a cab after that. So this whole sequence includes the uh, mode selection or the uh, whether I take bus or car or uh, plane. Uh, in space uh, mission design context, it corresponds to what kind of propulsion system you want to use or what uh, which vehicle you want to use. And uh, it also includes uh, routing. So whether I will go through Chicago, I go through um, um, Charlotte or any other airport. So this routing in space correspond to the, uh, the mission sequence itself. And uh, also include what I need. For example, if I want to go to DC, probably I will have to take a, 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 have a dinner in, uh, on the way. So I will probably carry some food with me. So those consumables and, uh, uh, and other um, needed uh, uh, equipment and so on uh, are also considered as part of the commodity flow. So basically what we do on the ground uh, in the logistics paradigm uh, can be a leverage for space mission design. And by doing that, and with a lot of uh, 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 mathematical development, we can actually solve this space mission design problem and campaign design problem in a completely efficient way and provide um, useful insights. So this next slide uh, basically introduced some of the um, uh, some of the mathematical formulation uh, or the idea for mathematical formulation. Uh, that is used in this particular research. So what we use is uh, called a dynamic generalized multi-commodity flow. So here we have a generalized flow, which is a network with arcs uh, that involve gain or loss, and the multi-commodity flow, where we have a network with multiple commodities. 
including the, uh, for example, the um, crew or uh, consumables and uh, propane and vehicle and so on. And uh, we combine these two way of thinking. Uh, we, we, we develop a, a network flow model called generalized community, multi-community flow, which can deal with a multi-community flow with a, a community gain and loss, community type conversion, and, and a, a combination of them. So community uh, gain and loss um, basically represents, for example, uh, propane consumption. And the community type conversion basically represents uh, uh, converting a food to waste, for example, after after human consumption. And ISRU can be in interpreted as uh, both of them. You are gaining more and more resource from logistics point of view. And you can also interpret it as a, a, a commodity conversion from uh, ISRU plant to, to the actual resource. So by considering this kind of uh, 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 multi-community flow formulation, we can solve the uh, space logistics uh, design problem as a network problem. And uh, uh, in addition to this uh, static network, we also need to consider the time dimension in order to consider multiple mission sequences. So we add a time dimension uh, to this uh, space dimension. And this time dimension um, is used to uh, represent the time windows and ordering of the missions. And if we naively uh, extend the network in the time dimension, it will uh, it will become so computationally intractable. So we develop a method to reduce the number of time steps so that uh, uh, we can solve the problem in a, uh, in a computationally efficient way with guaranteed solution bounds. So the next slide is basically the, uh, the mathematical formulation. I will not get into the details here, but uh, uh, basically we consider each pair of nodes in that uh, network figure I just showed earlier. Uh, as, a, as a network flow, we have an outflow and the inflow, and this X is basically a vector of all the commodity that is flowing over this arc, and Y is a, uh, is a vehicle that is uh, flowing over the arc. And uh, we have a cost uh, function, which here we assume a linear function, which uh, can be considered as a launch mass, for example. Or if we have a cost modeling, then we can, uh, we can add a cost to this uh, objective function as well. And we have a constraint for each uh, node and each arc. For each node, we have a mass balance. Basically, what that said is the inflow and outflow should be balanced out uh, with the difference within the demand or supply at that particular node. So if uh, uh, the, the moon has a, a, a demand of a crew of six, so if you want to deliver six crew to the moon at a particular, particular time, then that is the demand. So the inflow uh, into the, that moon and that moon node, an outflow that comes out from that moon node, uh, the difference should be uh, that uh, six crew members, so that these six crew members are observed uh, by the lunar node. And then after a certain time, this, uh, uh, the, the, the crew can, be, uh, can, can return back to the Earth. Then when the time window opens, uh, we just say we have a supply of six crew members on the moon, so that uh, then the inflow and outflow will be balanced out so that we actually carry that six uh, uh, um, crew members back to the Earth. So this is how we consider this mass balance. And then we have a flow transformation, which basically uh, says what happens during that arc. So when, when, uh, when the X plus, which is the um, outflow from node I, and the uh, X uh, minus that goes into node J, and uh, um, this flow transformation will describe the relationship between this X plus and X minus. So this can be, uh, for example, uh, uh, propane consumption. So uh, when you depart the node I, you have a uh, uh, propane and you have the uh, spacecraft uh, or the dry mass. Then when you uh, uh, flow into the node J after a certain time, then uh, the amount of propane will be reduced uh, depending on how much dry mass you have, basically using rocket equation or, or high fidelity version of that. And we have a flow capacity. Uh, this basically says you need to, uh, the program amount you can carry should be within the uh, tank and so on. So we have a bunch of flow capacity uh, to, to make the problem more realistic. And then we have time window, which is governed by flow non-negativity uh, constraint. And the last one is the uh, spacecraft sizing model. I will talk about this a little bit. Uh, in the next slide, but uh, uh, um, we can, again, as I said in the beginning, we can consider two versions of the problem. One is uh, to design the spacecraft within the optimization, 
or we can say we have a discrete choice of uh, spacecraft uh, like Orion or or um, or uh, Dragon and so on, and uh, you will uh, let the optimizer to choose the best uh, vehicle for each leg. So that's basically uh, the two uh, way of formulating the problem. In, in this particular formulation, we we say let us design the spacecraft using some data driven model. So um, we leveraged this uh, uh, the literature um, by Christian Taylor in 2007. So it's a little bit uh, outdated. We are updating this model now. But uh, basically what Christian did is uh, uh, she basically uh, collected the data of uh, different uh, um, cis-lunar vehicle. And uh, she created a data-driven model. She so basically uh, had a um, fitting uh, and found this function to, to govern the relationship between the uh, payload capacity, propane capacity, and structure mass. So um, this is basically a little bit higher fidelity than just using inert mass ratio, which is what we did in the past. Um, so inert mass ratio is a good way to linearly size a spacecraft, but uh, um, it can result in some um, uh, in, in practical uh, solution, so unrealistic solution. Uh, whereas this uh, uh, spacecraft sizing model will consider non-linearity, so it gets uh, uh, it has a little bit higher fidelity than the than the linear model. So we are using this model, and we have a way to um, to formulate this problem in a computationally efficient way, despite uh, this uh, uh, seemingly messy formulation. Uh, okay. Yes, well, I uh, I want to remind the audience that uh, the uh, that is watching right now that they can ask questions. Uh, in the chat uh, on the YouTube channel, and uh, and we'll pick them up uh, toward the end of the, the the talk. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the so I talked about spacecraft sizing model, uh, but uh, uh, we also need to size uh, ISLU plant because ISLU plant is another uh, nonlinear system that uh, we need to consider in this uh, in this model. So uh, for this particular uh, problem, we'll use this uh, some Shriners model uh, where uh, we have uh, different subsystem uh, like a reactor, ex uh, excavator, uh, hopper feed feeding system, and storage and power system. And we have uh, uh, optimal sizing for each of these uh, uh, models. So we have a um, kind of sub-optimization within ISRU plan model. And once we do this sub optimization, we can get a relationship uh, on the right hand side, which is a, a relationship between the oxygen production. In this case, it's a molten regular electrolysis process. So it generates oxygen out of the uh, uh, lunar uh, in situ resource. So it's a relationship between the oxygen production and the uh, mass specific uh, oxygen, oxygen production. So the y axis is essentially the efficiency, and the x axis is the production. So as you can see, if we produce more and more, the plant becomes more and more efficient because uh, 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 due, due to the um, economy kind of economy of uh, scale effect, uh, because you can um, you can have a store the, the bigger the storage the more efficient the system becomes. So we can consider all this nonlinear effect with uh, uh, with this uh, sub optimization model, and we can again generate this uh, 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 this uh, uh, mathematical model in the bottom. And uh, we are doing more than that. I'll talk about this a little bit in the end. But uh, in the NASA-funded research uh, next step uh, program, yeah. the PI, uh, we are trying to develop this uh, model by considering different uh, processes, not only multi uh, molten regular electrolysis, but also other uh, processes. And we're also trying to um, integrate this uh, ISRU optimization as part of the logistics optimization. So instead of considering this ISRU as a black box, you get this plot that we use this result. We are actually integrating this uh, optimization as part of the logistics optimization. And uh, I don't have a result for that yet, but I will talk about how we do that uh, in the end briefly. So uh, given this mission planning, uh, the network modeling and uh, for, for the mission planning part and uh, spacecraft design and uh, uh, spacecraft sizing and uh, uh, infrastructure sizing. So given all these models, we can integrate all of them into uh, um, uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming. However, we developed some method to make this nonlinear programming uh, linear by using a piecewise linear function, so so that uh, we can convert this entire problem into a mixed integer linear programming, which uh, turns out to be computationally very efficient. I will show an example later and uh, also introduce how efficient it is. 
And uh, uh, the more uh, details about the mathematical method is, uh, uh, is in publication. Again, I'm happy to share uh, with you if, uh, if you have any questions or if you want to access this uh, publication. So uh, I think I spent enough time about math. I will uh, talk about uh, uh, one example result. So um, this is a case study we did uh, for this uh, particular paper that I, I just uh, showed uh, earlier. Um, it's uh, basically Apollo type lunar campaign. We are sending more crew, more crew members on Apollo, but everything else we just followed Apollo type. So it's a relatively simple, but we can do more complex missions uh, as needed. Um, uh, so for this particular mission, we consider a demand and supply in the following table, in the bottom table. So uh, we we say say you know the supply happens at any time. If we need something, we can get uh, a crew and the equipment from the Earth if needed, and we can get sample from the lunar surface if needed. Uh, but the, the demand uh, happens on the lunar surface uh, at uh, in this case day five. So at day five, we need to deliver twelve crew members to the moon. So that's a uh, uh, that's. Uh, that's an input to the optimization, and say at uh, uh, day eight, and again, this is just an example, but we can we can change all this number, but at day eight, we need to, uh, 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 we need to send um, 12 crew members from the moon, and at day 13, we need to return them to Earth. And uh, also, um, we say at day five, we need to deliver this 4,200 kilogram of equipment on, to the moon, so uh, there's a demand on the moon, at day five, uh, the amount is, is 4,200 kilograms. And we need to, um, uh, uh, there's a demand of samples on Earth of 500 kilograms. So these 500 kilograms are brought back from the moon. We don't care when it departs the moon, but we care that it, will, it has to arrive at the Earth uh, at day 13. So this is basically, again, this is, this is just an example, but uh, it's, it's a really, really simple example, but uh, um, I, I hope it gives you some sense what kind of input we give to the optimization. We don't tell the optimization, we don't tell the optimizer uh, how we will deliver this, uh, what is the mission sequence. We don't tell the optimizer. We only tell the optimizer that we need this uh, uh, 12 crew members at day five on the moon. So we need the 13, uh, uh, 500 kilograms of lunar samples on Earth at day 13. So these are the only inputs we give to the optimization. And the optimization will uh, basically went through the, uh, the formulation that I introduced earlier and give you uh, the entire mission sequence, including when to launch what from where to where and uh, what is the sizing of the spacecraft in this particular case. So this is one example of a single mission case. So we say we just have that, uh, 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 that demand I showed earlier one time. So it's a single mission. And uh, so this is a result we can get. Um, uh, for example, in this case, we have uh, four spacecraft. Basically, here the spacecraft means the state. So we have a four-stage spacecraft, and uh, um, we have uh, um, uh, one stage that will stay at low lunar orbit, and the remaining stages go to the lunar surface. And then we have a smaller stage that will carry the crew back uh, uh, back to the Earth. So it basically shows this staging uh, problem. It also says you have to keep something uh, uh, like a program depot in low lunar orbit so that you can leverage it later on. And in this case, we, we we limit our spacecraft type to two, so that's why it seems there are uh, um, four stages. Where whereas in reality, you know, it basically only considers three stages. But uh, 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 in this case, we also have the size of each stages at the bottom. So we have one big one and one small one. The big one carries I sorry, uh, sorry the big one carries all the equipment, and the small one carries the crew mainly. So basically, this whole sequence is some uh, is uh, given by the optimization. We only give we only give the optimization uh, optimizer the demand and supply, and the optimizer will uh, will tell you this entire mission sequence when to launch what from where to where. But still, you may say uh, if it, it's only a single mission case, you can probably do it by hand. You can still get a pretty optimal result. But if we have uh, multiple missions, it becomes more and more complex. So the next slide, I show a three mission case where basically we repeat that demand and supply three times and we repeat that once a year. So we have a three year mission uh, and, and each year we have that same demand and supply. And uh, so this is a, a result. And as you can see, the mission result, uh, the result is actually more complex than, uh, than the single mission. It's not just repeating the single mission three times. 
it's actually doing uh, much more sophisticated uh, mission design. For example, um, as we expect, it uses ISRU. So uh, it launched ISRU on the first mission. In this case, it launches uh, 1,400 kilograms of ISRU. And uh, uh, these ISRU are leveraged later on. So, uh, and this ISRU amount is optimized based on this mission sequence, uh, sorry, mission demand. And, uh, um, and it will also optimize the propane depot size. As you can see, the propane depot, which is basically uh, the vehicle that stays at uh, low lunar orbit, um, uh, it grows over time. In the beginning, you have uh, one vehicle, and then later on, you have more and more because ISRU is generating more and more resources, and you need to store it somewhere so that it can be leveraged in later missions. And uh, um, and it will optimize uh, the spacecraft design uh, considering the ISRU we need to carry and considering all the equipment we need to carry. So the spacecraft uh, uh, um, is uh, a little bit bigger than the previous example. and. Um, uh, in this case, it's optimizing the uh, launch mass, and uh, it basically can uh, can consider all the possibilities of ISRU uh, deployment, utilization, and uh, spacecraft design, and uh, mission design, uh, the interaction between each missions, and all, all other uh, consideration that uh, uh, a typical mission design practice would, would uh, take into consideration. And uh, in fact, I, I only showed this one one mission case and three mission case. But it turns out when we uh, run different mission cases, that uh, ISRU only becomes effective when we have uh, three or more missions. So when you run two mission case, the optimizer does not choose ISRU. But when we run three mission case, optimizer start to choose ISRU. And when we run four mission case, optimizer will prefer ISRU. So uh, this is a um, this is can this can give you a. Uh, um, objective result. It is completely run by optimization. We didn't uh, give any information about uh, uh, when to use ISRU. We only give the ISRU productivity uh, as a design model, and we say we need this crew member on the moon at you know, this time, this time, this time. And the optimizer will tell you when to use ISRU, how, what is the size of ISRU, and how to use, uh, uh, what is the mission sequences that uh, deploy and utilize ISRU, all by, done by optimization. So this is, I think, this is very uh, powerful tool. And uh, 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 what's surprising is that it actually is competition very efficient thanks to some of the uh, uh, method developed uh, um, by our group and uh, some other group in this uh, research area. Uh, for this particular case, it takes five minutes on the desktop computer, so it's uh, it's very fast. So. Uh, um, in, in the end uh, of my talk, I want to introduce briefly about the ongoing research and uh, uh, some of the uh, methodology we're thinking recently. So as I said, uh, we are funded by NASA Next Step uh, right now, and we're working on this ISRU system model. Uh, and uh, we have considered different subsystems and uh, for different uh, chemical processes. And the idea is to integrate that into space logistics model. So instead of considering ISRU as a black box and we get the result and we use that result for space uh, mission planning, we actually can integrate this ISRU trace study into the space uh, um, uh, mission design. So that will enable us to do different trade off like, a, uh, um, uh, like the example shown below, what is a reactor type selection or what is the operation sequence for ISRU and the deployment timeline location trace studies. And uh, um, so uh, in the end, I just want to summarize what we do and uh, some other future research directions we are, we are considering. Uh, so one of the things that we didn't uh, talk about today, I didn't talk about today is uncertainties. So in reality, space mission always involve uncertainties like launch delay, failures, and so on. And we are considering uh, these uncertainties in a, a stochastic optimization framework, and uh, that's something we're working on now. And we're also trying to leverage some of the most uh, updated uh, machine learning techniques to make this optimization more scalable uh, so that we can consider a higher fidelity model or more complex uh, uh, mission. And uh, again, in the end, I want to uh, stress the value of this research because it, uh, in, in that it can provide a fair analysis of the value of ISRU. I've heard people say ISRU is effective. Other people say ISRU is not. It pays off. It does not. Uh, it depends on the assumption. It depends on all the you know all the mission we are looking at. But uh, uh, this uh, tool can give you an objective uh, result. I mean, you you give the tool, the model, and the in, uh, demand and supply, and it will give you the uh, objective uh, 
result analysis of the value of ISRU uh, without uh, a human bias. And uh, it can also give you a, a, a mission design, including all the uh, trajectory design and, and the spacecraft design. So, uh, and we're, it is still work in progress. We're still working on this. Um, and uh, we hope to increase fidelity and make this uh, tool more and more powerful and hopefully uh, uh, complement uh, what uh, the current NASA or uh, other space agencies practice to to try to uh, uh, provide decision support tool for, for mission design. So in the end, I want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge uh, the, uh, my grad students and also the sponsorship from by NASA. And also part of the research was uh, performed by uh, ULA's support uh, in Cicerona 1000 program and, and also other uh, sponsor uh, for, for the research in our group. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Koki. Uh, excellent. Um, we, uh, we're we going to uh, uh, go straight to the questions from the audience uh, since they have this opportunity. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, our Secretary of RT, uh, Paul Vent Professor Venturzante at uh, Michigan Tech, and uh, he's going to read uh, some of those questions. All right, let's see. We have a, a question here from uh, Stefan first. Uh, hold on. The right question. Here we go. Um, so the question here is what sub technologies, you know, key sub technologies, have you considered? You, you mentioned one about the uh, uh, molten salt electrolysis, but are there any other? Uh, ones you have looked at, and which one do you think are the most useful ones that have the, the most, I guess, beneficial effect on ISRU? In other words, could make this trade study better uh, in favor of ISRU, if you will. Yeah, that is a, a good question, and uh, I don't have an immediate answer. So we have considered different uh, uh, ISRU process, you know, which include uh, modern rigorous analysis, of course, and also more traditional hydrogen reduction analysis or um, uh, water electrolysis. Uh, um, assuming there's a water we can we can access, and uh, uh, also for Mars we consider atmosphere based uh, um, uh, based um, process and uh, assuming there's a and also uh, uh, different other process including the uh, um, the uh, soil based um, process on the moon. Uh, sorry, on Mars. But uh, uh, the part that I don't have a quick uh, um, the right answer now is uh, about which one will work the best. It will depend on the mission demand and supply, as I mentioned. So in the particular analysis uh, for, for lunar exploration, um, if we can get the water ice and electrolyze that, that will be uh, very efficient because you can get both oxygen and hydrogen at the same time. <laughs> what is the productivity we can achieve using the water electrolysis? So it will depend on the model we use. So um, I would say all the tool I have introduced is, uh, is a way to to analyze the result. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say the result I show in this slide is the right answer. But uh, if you have some new model for ISRU uh, or new model for chemical process, we can definitely put that into this tool and see what it comes out, uh, what, what it provides. And that's something what we're doing uh, for, for, the, uh, for NASA Next Step program right now. Again, I don't have a result right now, but we'll generate results over the next couple of months. Um, before the project ends. And uh, and also, uh, we did some work for ULA too, uh, using their particular assumption for ISRU model. Okay, very good. Um, another question um, here from um, M. Palish from uh, UNSW in Sydney. Um, welcome, by the way. Um, anyway, so this is a question of um, how do you consider the, I guess, current situation and eventual future activities? And so uh, the needs of the now may be different than the needs later. Something that's valuable in one location now may not be valuable there later because of other activities. How do you take that change of time, the growth of, uh, I guess, the architecture uh, in, in account, into account in your modeling? 
Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. So in, in our modeling, we consider a fixed time horizon. So we have, a, for example, 10 year time horizon and we have, a, say, you know, five Mars mission or, or 10 lunar mission during that 10 year time horizon. And, uh, and we will optimize this 10, 10 year time horizon all together. So in the end, it will give the, uh, the value of each of this, uh, uh, each of this uh, 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 for example, like I survey resource at each time step separately. So we'll get the different value and we will take into consideration how the value changes. But in reality, there is no fixed time horizon in a, in a sense. So we don't have say uh, uh, 10 years to, to consider all the value. The, the mission will continue after 10 years uh, or you will, you will terminate before that. So we need to take into consideration some sort of rolling horizon way of thinking. And uh, we did some work about Mars mission design in one of the paper uh, where we consider the uh, Kind of transient phase and the uh, uh, um, and the uh, steady phase, a uh, steady state phase. So, uh, in the first uh, say ten years, we we'll, we are at the growing phase where we will keep uh, growing our uh, ISRU plant and growing our resource economy in Cicero space. But at some point, we will reach a reach a steady state, and uh, uh, so that uh, the value of each resource will also reach a steady state. And how do we consider this transient state and, and steady state, and how do we optimize? Uh, considering in both states. So that that's uh, another way of looking at this problem. And I think that's uh, one way to consider how uh, how this value will change uh, changes over time. So that kind of answer the question. Uh, yeah, very good. So the fixed time horizon, I think, is a, is a crucial thing here. And you got to probably assume a certain scenario to do any number crunching at this point in time, unless you have it organically grow unlimited with some rules or something like that. Yes. Okay, other question from uh, Otis uh, Walton here is, uh, uh, there, there are many unknowns with resource extraction and recovery. Are there any uh, uncertainty quantifications, uh, maybe a probabilistic approach that is included in your modeling? Yes, uh, not, not in this particular uh, slide that I showed because uh, it was limited in time. But for, for every research we do, we always do sensitivity analysis to see what is the value of this, uh, uh, um, uh, what is the impact of, uh, for example, changing ISRU productivity rate. And uh, this is important for two reasons. One is uh, to show the uncertainties, like how, how the uncertainty will impact the mission design. And the second is to show um, uh, when does the ISRU become ineffective? For example, I said uh, uh, when ISRU uh, model is what I used in this research, it turns out it's useful for three missions. Uh, so Optimizer chose ISRU for that particular mission. But if, for example, ISRU productivity is a little bit lower, maybe the Optimizer would not chose ISRU for three missions. So where is the cutoff? Where is the, uh, uh, where is the uh, basically the boundary become uh, between the ISRU being effective and ISRU being not effective? It is a very interesting insight we can get out of this optimization. So that's one reason we do the sensitivity analysis. And in addition to this, we are doing, uh, uh, as I said briefly in the presentation, we are leveraging some of the uh, uh, machine learning techniques, considering the stochastic uh, uh, formulation for this problem. And uh, uh, the challenge of stochastic formulation uh, is uh, cause of dimensionality. So the, the problem will explode very quickly uh, if we uh, naively design the system uh, uh, under uh, under uncertainties, but we have some. Uh, we can use some method from reinforcement learning to to uh, to basically avoid those curves of dimensionality, and that's a work that uh, is ongoing. And we uh, we plan to present uh, uh, the the work in the in the conference in the near future. Okay, very good. Um, one other question uh, is so. You're working with a fixed scenario, but what about, uh, I guess, different locations? Are you looking at, for instance, also IRCU for Mars? And, and how does that change, uh, I guess, your assumptions, but also the outcomes? I would assume for Mars, you might find that ISRU might after one mission. Yeah, so ISRU is uh, using a... Uh, um, it can, the model can be used on Mars, on, on, on the Moon, and asteroid in other places. Yeah, and we have done some analysis for Mars ISRU as well. And Mars ISRU uh, can be effective, uh, uh, um, again, depending on the assumption, but it can be effective uh, uh, within a pretty short time horizon. 
But uh, again, the time window itself for Mars is, is much longer than, than the Moon, so you can really fairly compare, uh, do a fair comparison whether the Moon lunar SRU and Mars SRU, which one is more effective. But um, uh, if we consider a Mars mission campaign uh, via uh, cis lunar space, then I, I can see uh, we can use lunar resource and Mars resource both in a, uh, uh, in, a in combination so that they can uh, provide some the lunar resource can provide the program or other uh, resource on the way uh, for the mission on the way to Mars. And the Mars ISRU can provide the resource on, on the way back uh, to, to Earth. And uh, this kind of scenario have, uh, have appeared in the analysis uh, we did in the past. But again, uh, depending on what you're putting to the optimization, the optimization will do the uh, mission analysis from scratch and it will tell you the results. So depending on the uh, I saw productivity or what kind of resource you get from the Mars. Again, do, do you get uh, just doing the uh, oxygen uh, or you're getting both oxygen and hydrogen or whether you're getting methane or what resource you get will really change the, the effectiveness of ISRU. So um, I don't have a, again, I don't have a right answer uh, unless we actually run the model, but uh, uh, our past experience showed that we can generate some mission scenario if we have a, a, a decent ISRU system on Mars. Does that answer the question? Yeah, do we have any more question, Paul? That's the last time, last one I saw, Chris, did you see any other ones? Okay. I take opportunity to introduce uh, to the audience uh, our vice chair of the technical committee, Professor Chris Dreyer at the Colorado School of Mines. <laughs> hi, Chris. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I've been here from the beginning. So, um, yeah, I'm Chris Dreyer. I'm the vice chair of the uh, technical committee. And, um, well, I've been, been following along. And, and Koki, thanks for a great, great talk. Um, I think a uh, space logistics is a very important area for uh, for this discussion about space resources, it, uh, I think if used correctly, we change the the kind of dynamics of how we do space. Um, I think I think guys, we're everyone, we're coming up uh, close on the end of our our time period that we had allotted for this uh, talk. So um, we do have one question, other question. Um, it's more directed directly at us. Um, that's from. Um, uh, Steph, Stefan Van Wall, who uh, had mentioned he's a uh, postdoc at, at JAXA and looking for new opportunity, I guess, uh, getting to get into space resources. And that's a good question for, for anyone who might be viewing this is, is how might you get into space resources? Um, one thing is, is visiting um, different conferences that are kind of key for the, the area. Um, the technical committee here has um, been active in, in many of those. Some of those are AAA conferences, uh, a few are coming up. The next one coming up is the Space Resources Roundtable, which uh, my university holds, uh, the, well, that is held at my university, uh, university Colorado, Colorado School of Mines. Uh, others are coming up in about a year is the Earth and Space Conference, uh, which will be in S Seattle. Um, and um, the the are a number of people working in the field. Uh, those of us on the committee are all doing that, and there's a lot of other people. So uh, anyone interested in getting into the field, please just contact us, and we'll help uh, connect you to to the community. Yeah, that's a very good point uh, because um, this is this is the the, uh, the effort that we're trying to. Uh, to to generate to to create here to 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 create more communication between people who are not in the field and with people who are already in the field. Uh, there is this is a rapidly evolving field um, with uh, clearly several governments around the world uh, looking at uh, sending missions to uh, identify resources uh, on the moon and uh, and on Mars and. Um, including uh, other actors, uh, private actors and government actors, 
looking at asteroid as possible resources. So we can see that in the 21st century, this is something that is uh, uh, is, is growing in interest and, and really captivates the imagination of many engineers and scientists. So I encourage you to uh, to 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 keep in touch uh, through uh, some of these hangouts. Uh, you can also reach out to us uh, through our Facebook page and uh, and visit the AIAA uh, website to, uh, to, to, to correspond with some of the officers that you see here. Um, I'm going to actually uh, conclude this uh, hangout tonight. Uh, first, to th by uh, thanking uh, Professor Kogi Ho once again, and uh, mm -hmm. and by by uh, sharing uh, information about the space resources roundtable coming up and our Facebook page. Uh, is it was there another comment before I do that? No. Okay. So let me do this right now, and uh, I'm going to share uh, just a single single slide here, uh, where uh, basically uh, you can find us uh, on Facebook and uh, put comments, ask us questions. Uh, share your information with others, and we, uh, we definitely want uh, new new members and new new inputs. Uh, so we will um, have another hangout uh, from Space Resources Roundtable in Golden, Colorado. Uh, the the conference is it will take place uh, between June 11 and 14, 2019. And if you're in, if you're there in person, then come join us technical committee, which will be on Tuesday evening of the conference, and uh, you'll find information about the conference at this website. And so with that, um, we will uh, conclude our Hangout, and uh, I hope all of you enjoy your day, and uh, see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.